morning. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Pryor and Dr. Olschunger, for allowing me to give us such a long titled talk today. I had to actually look at this talk a couple times and reread it just to make sure I was hitting everything that I needed to talk about. So we're going to cruise through some of this. Let's see. There we go. So we're going to talk about both elective and emergent uh, parasophageal hiatal hernia repairs. And we're going to break it down into an algorithm, a treatment algorithm. I'm going to save a lot of the talk about the actual hiatal hernia repair to my speakers that are following. Uh, but we're going to talk about what to do before and after uh, that repair. So you get this patient coming into your office. There's two things you need to be asking. Is this actually symptomatic? And is this patient a good candidate for surgery? The old saying was that every parasophageal, and we're talking about our type 2, type 3 parasophageal hernias, you know, everyone got fixed, right? So now it's really if they're symptomatic. And some patients may come in and say they're not really symptomatic, but you go through a really thorough uh, history with them, and you start to realize, oh, they've been having some pulmonary issues. They're getting recurrent pneumonias. That's considered symptomatic um, and really should be repaired. And what to do with those asymptomatic, truly asymptomatic parasophageals? So we've realized that they have a pretty low risk of emergency surgery, um, less than 2% risk. And lifetime risk at the age of 18 is about, eight, or at 65 is about 18%. So in those patients, you want to counsel them. This is a young patient, uh, has you know, really good health. You don't, it's maybe a good time to fix them versus when they're 85 and they start to really have severe symptoms. So this is the algorithm that I tend to think about when I'm working up a patient with a parasophageal hernia. And so we're going to first tackle the first block up here, preoperative evaluation, because it's always a question of what to get, what's useful, what's not useful. Um, and the important thing to remember is you only want to order what you need. You don't want to be getting all these extra tests that really aren't going to give you any benefit when you're talking about your operative intervention. So there's a whole list of things that patients may come in with or you may consider sending them out for. Um, patients may come in with a chest x-ray already. They may have been a, you know, bronchitis and they find this big air fluid level in the chest and that's how they get over to you. But the three things we're going to focus on for this talk is really the esophagram, the EGD, and the manometry. So your upper GI is really your best confirmatory test. You don't necessarily need to send a patient for a CAT scan uh, preoperatively. And this is going to let you know how big this hernia is. It's going to tell you what's involved as far as how much stomach is up into the chest. Uh, it's also going to allow you to find out where that GE junction is. The reason why that's important is you want to find out at least ahead of time if there's a shortened a foreshortened esophagus. It, it changes the way that I consent my patients. I talk a little bit more heavily about a colis gastroplasty. And so back there. So then the EGD, it's really important to make sure that we don't have any other pathology at the time of our surgery. You want to make sure that you've looked for things like a Barrett's esophagitis, any ulcers that need to be treated. Um, and so I find a lot of value in, in going ahead with an EGD preoperatively. This can also clue you in on the length of the esophagus by getting that, um, that esophageal length with the endoscope. And then you have your manometry. And so it, it, it isn't really a useful tool as a conform confirmatory test. And you can see a double hump phenomenon on the manometry. But it's not your confirmatory test. What this is useful for is for what you're going to do after your hyalur hernia repair. Are you going to do an anti-reflux procedure? We're going to talk about that in a couple seconds. So then moving on, that's your preoperative evaluation. Your hiatal hernia repair, I'm just going to briefly talk about the importance of preoperative uh, preparation for this. Um, you want to have your armamentarium, and a lot of the speakers today are going to talk about what's involved in that toolbox that we have as surgeons. And it's not just the literal tools, like having a mesh available or a bougie available, a uh, red rubber catheter if you happen to get into the pleural cavity, for example. Um, but it's also a technical armamentarium that you have. You can't close the cruise. What are you going to do? What kind of options do you have? What do you feel comfortable doing? If you make that lateral release, where are you going to put it? Are you going to cover it? What are you going to cover it with? Um, so you need to have all those things in the back of your mind. Not two parasophageal hernia surgeries are, the, are like, and you really want to make sure that you have all the tools that you need uh, at the ready when you go in for your procedure. And so moving on, let's talk about first the wraps. Um, and, and I'm going to talk about anti-reflux procedures. You see the bottom line here, we're really just focusing on anti-reflux procedures. Um, and we're going to break down each of these, see the little magnetic sphincter augmentation the links. We will talk about that briefly too, because the FDA indications just changed recently. But let's focus in on the wrap first. Why do we wrap? Well, 
we know that we really should be wrapping a lot of these patients. About a third of patients will come to you with a parasophageal hernia already having reflux symptoms. And if you don't actually fix the reflux at the time of the surgery, another third can also go on to have reflux. So you're, gonna, you're talking about 65% of patients who have not undergone anti-reflux procedure with the parasophageal hernia repair will develop reflux postoperatively. It's a pretty significant number. So it does a couple things. It will restore the competency of the LES. It's gonna reduce the risk of postoperative reflux disease. And it also creates kind of an anchor underneath the diaphragm. So it creates that bulk underneath there to help prevent the reherniation. And of course, um, reduces the, the risk of symptoms. So if there may be a type one does recur afterwards, the risk of developing symptoms from that small recurrence are very low if there is an anti-reflux procedure that's been performed with the hiatal hernia repair. So then which one do you do? Do you do Nissen or do you do Tupé? I'm not gonna be up here to argue that discussion because there are many schools of thought on that. There are some places that will only do a Tupé. There are some places that will rely on manometry. And there's no wrong answer when it comes to that uh, necessarily. The Nissen and the Tupé give fairly equivalent results when it comes to the anti-reflux um, outcome. And if you are gonna do a Nissen, I do recommend getting your mo mobility study. You wanna make sure the esophagus is able to overcome that full 360 wrap. All right, so moving on. So now, this is a, I'm a bariatric surgeon as well as a foregut surgeon, and so I like to keep, like this part of the algorithm because it really does mesh both of those things together, and it's a really important discussion to have with patients that qualify for bariatric surgery. It really is a phenomenal anti-reflux procedure, not to mention you're also reducing a patient's weight, which can help reduce the risk of recurrence of that hiatal hernia. So you're doing a couple of things with that procedure. We know already that the gastric bypass does a really good job of treating reflux disease. About 85% resolution rates postoperatively with gastric bypass. We also know that when you go head to head with the gastric bypass and a fundal plication, that they give pretty equivalent results that are not significantly different. But is it safe for patients with a large parasophageal hernia? And Dr. Perry's group out of Ohio State actually did look at this. Is it safe and is it effective? It was a group of about 10 patients, 11 patients, but, um, but all the patients did very well. It was proven to be safe and effective, and the patients do well. Why? Because they lose that weight and they reduce their risk of recurrence. Um, so this is actually the largest study that's out there to date, but it shows that we can do this together. So I'm going to put in here a little bit about the links, um, because actually it's really just changed recently. In the last year, we've had two really good studies looking at hiatal hernias larger than three centimeters coming out now. Of course, these studies are not looking at necessarily all parasophageals. We're looking at any hiatal hernia that's larger than three centimeters. So we can't truly extrapolate, but it's something that's worth a discussion, I believe. And so this first study came out. Um, and this study within the same year, looking at one was 50 patients and the other 200 patients, followed out for about a year and a half on average and shown that they did very well postoperatively, um, no increased risk of early recurrence, for example. Um, so in March, so this is just past month, um, the FDA actually updated the indications for the links to include any hiatal hernia greater than three, which was originally a contraindication. So now any hiatal hernia greater than three centimeters, it certainly needs to be repaired, but it is safe to go ahead and place the links. And of course, that's gonna generate some conversation, I believe, in this room, um, and that's a good thing. Uh, so we can talk about this as we move forward. So I briefly want to talk about emergent cases. Hopefully you don't run into a lot of these. It's a very rare circumstance, but uh, we're talking about most patients that are having some kind of ischemia of the stomach. They come in emergently. They're obstructed from a, usually a volvulized stomach. Um, what do we do with those patients? Well, first, how do we study it? What are we looking for? Um, CT scan in this case is actually fairly important and very useful. What are, are we dealing with? Um, what is the rotation of that stomach? It's sometimes hard to figure out on an upper GI. And so a CAT scan here could be more readily used um, in, in these cases. But again, you don't want to over, you're not going to take an emergent patient for manometry preoperatively, right? So you want to really pick and choose what you're going to be getting uh, before you treat these patients. And then really, what are you doing uh, to treat them? And I say their goal is to make an emergent case a non-emergent case. That's really what you're trying to do. You don't want to be doing a formal repair necessarily in the emergent setting. You really can't. Um, so whatever you can do to get these patients through and avoid emergent surgery, make it more uh, urgent um, surgery, is really ideal. 
Um, so NG tube intubation to decompress the stomach and help devolvulize the stomach is ideal. If that doesn't work, um, endoscopy uh, may be more successful. But if these two things do not work, you have to move on to surgery, and you want to move on to surgery fairly quickly if these things do not work. Um, but usually they do. In two-thirds of patients, they are able to get discharged without surgical intervention. The reason why we want to try to inter intervene on these patients early if the NG tube or endoscopy fails is because the morbidity rate you can see there is significantly higher in patients that um, do not go within a day of presentation. So you don't want to wait on these patients. So you want to intervene. And certainly, there's a various degree of what we're going to be doing when we actually do intervene. And it all depends on the surgeon's comfort level and the patient's stability. The patient's truly unstable, we're worried about ischemia, they're on pressors. You may just get in and be able to pack the stomach down and get out and call it a day um, and just make sure that the stomach does not uh, incur any more ischemia. And that's really gonna be a discussion with the patient and discussion with the patient's family, of course. All right, so things to take away from this talk. Order only what you need, not what you don't. Have a plan in your mind, but also have plan B, plan C, plan D at your, at your ready. You want to build your armamentarium. That means the skills that you have, the skills of the team that are around you, and the tools that you need to perform. You want to really try to make all your emergent cases more like urgent or elective cases, and you don't want to delay if the patient is truly emergent. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'll take questions at the end.